whenever a storyteller comes into a space and sees all of the smiling faces, the storyteller will say crick, and all of the eager listeners will say crack. So let's try it again. Crick! Crack! Ooh, we're getting there. All right. So why is storytelling so important? Telling our stories are our lifeblood. Because for so long, our stories have been told on our behalf. And when the stories are told on your behalf, there is a proverb that goes, if the lion never tells his story, then the hunter is always the hero. So many of the stories that we've heard about ourselves create misunderstanding and leave us thinking that we are standing alone. Every time I take a stage, I remind myself that though you see me, I represent 10,000 and more. Some whose stories you heard and others stories that you've never been told. So whether we are telling our personal stories, our cultural narratives, fables, or even folk tales, they are the stories that give us strength, the stories of resilience, and the stories that give us power. Crick. Nice. Long ago, the sky was very close to the ground. It was so close to the ground that Whenever you wanted anything, you just reach up and take a bite. The sky tasted like anything that you could imagine. So preference wasn't a problem. Anything you desired, you could find. But the people, as people do, they took more and more. Instead of one handful, they took two and three, ate some, and left the rest on the ground. So after some time, there were bits of the sky left all over the ground. So much so that the sky became angry. And without notice, it grew dark. The clouds rolled in, thunder boomed, and lightning striked. A loud voice came from the heavens and said, you greedy people, if you do not listen, you will learn. And with that, the sky cleared and everything went back to normal. But the people thought about what they heard and they went back to their good behavior. They went back to taking one handful and leaving the rest. And this went on for some time. And King Aben, who was ruler over all the people, was so proud of the work that they were doing that he decided to have a feast. He invited everyone to come and said, only come in your best dress, bring nothing. He turned to his helpers and he said, just take a piece of the sky and make great platters. So there was fruit of every color and vegetables of every design. There was rice, chicken, fish, chapati, all lovely things to eat. The people came and they danced to the music, they listened to the poets, and they even listened to the tales spun by the storytellers and they enjoyed themselves. When it was time to eat, they ate and ate and ate until they were almost full. But you know that feeling where you can have a little bit more? Well, when the people looked around, all the food was finished. But they thought to themselves, we can just take a bit of the sky. But everyone took a bit, and they took two handfuls instead of one. So what they didn't eat, they left behind. And again, there were bits of the sky left all over the ground, and this time, the sky was so angry that it grew dark and a loud voice came and said, now you will learn. And the sky began to pull up, up over the rocks, up over the trees, up over the people, up over the mountains, higher and higher and higher. And it got to the point where no one could reach for the sky. We all had to learn to hunt, to fish, to garden, and to cook in order to sustain ourselves. Well, here is where the story usually ends. And we say that the people learned a valuable lesson that they should only take what they need and leave the rest. But here is my spin. The sky was in the wrong place. It was too close for us to reach. And knowing that the sky was so far that we had to overcome in order to reach it is the true story. You see, long ago, when we lived in Africa, we could fly. We would sing a tune, Kaua, Kaua, Kaua. And with 
that, there was a tingling in your feet, and it was almost like you could step on the clouds, reach up into the sky, spread black wings, and fly. And we did. Until, until that time where the stranger came and decided to pack us all on ships where wings couldn't spread. And we forgot. We forgot how to fly. We forgot our goodness. We forgot everything that gives us power, and we had to relearn it again. And that brings us to the story of Isla. Isla and her child working in the field where she tried to quiet a child that just couldn't be quieted. It was a time the child needed to fly but couldn't. And hanging on made it hurt, and so she cried. And Isla tried her best to cool and coo that baby but couldn't. Slave master cried out and said, you shut that child. But she could not. So she looked to her left, and when she looked to her left, she saw Jacob, who was all-knowing. He knew of everyone's past, he knew of Africa, and he told everyone there so. But when they heard the sound, Kaua, she looked at Jacob, and he shook his head no. The next day came, and again the child cried, wanting to be free, but stuck in this cradle while mother worked. And again, the slave master said, shut that baby again. And this time, I know, something, something happened to her in that moment. She broke. She knew that this wasn't the place that she needed to be. And where she was supposed to be is endless, limitless. And all she had to do was reach. This time, when the, it happened. She stood there. The slave master called, but she didn't hear a sound. But there was a snapping of a whip, and before it could land on her skin, she said, Kaua, Kaua. And with that, her feet started to tingle, but differently. She stepped on the grass, but it didn't touch her feet. She stepped on the top of the plants, but she couldn't feel it. She started to see herself stepping on clouds, and suddenly, the wings came back. She stretched her arms as far as they could, and for the very first time, that child did not cry. The child laughed, because finally, she was in the place that she should be, in the sky where there was all freedom. It was endless space that we could reach for and continue to get higher and higher. And so when we look at ourselves and we live in the silence and we don't share our own stories, we've forgotten that we can fly. But when we open ourselves up and we listen to each other, we realize that you don't stand alone. Your experience is the same as mine, as yours and yours. And together we can heal. Together we can fly. When we look up, we see our children like stars. We see them with their endless space reaching higher and higher and higher because that sound, Kahua, lives in our hearts. It fuels our soul. And we learn from each other. And we know that we are in our proper place because we can all fly. Of course, I love to come into spaces and give an Anansi story. Why? Because he's such an interesting character. And Anansi has done many things to help us, and well, he's also known for being very, very lazy. But one of the questions is, how did Anansi become so wise? <laughs> if you know who Spider-Man is, raise a hand. Well, Anansi is the original Spider-Man, the one who was truly a man, but craved for more. He would outsmart large and small creatures. And Nyame, the sky gods, looked upon Anansi and said, Anansi, you remind me of an immortal creature. We look at the spider as being a tiny thing, but Anansi had an opportunity to become an immortal, to become the one symbol that we talk about for generations as we listen to his stories, and he gives us our joy. And Nancy said yes to becoming immortal. 
And then Nancy quickly went back to Earth and saw all the things that people were doing, the good, the bad, and the indifferent. So when we say that a Nancy was lazy, he was thinking. When we say Anansi is a trickster, he was teaching us how to be resilient. And when we look at all of the other things in between, depending on who you talk to, well, some will laugh and some will hold their heads high at this spider with the face of a man and the body of a spider. But let's talk for a minute. How did common sense come into the world? Well. Long ago, Anansi was a collector of all kinds of things. He would collect shoes, clothes, boots, and even on Sunday, like this, he would go around to everyone's house in the village and collect Sunday dinner. But none of the things that Anansi was collecting were going to make him rich. And that was Anansi's goal, but here. <laughs> Anansi needed a bigger plan. When he saw his neighbor asking the postman for a bit of advice, and Nancy knew that if he had all the common sense in the world, then he too could sell it because he would be its only source. Well, and Nancy went out with a plastic bag and started to collect common sense from all places, and like plastic bags normally work, it got a little hole that became a big one. And then the common sense started to ooze out of the side. So when Nancy became environmentally friendly and put all of his common sense in a paper bag, and when paper bags get wet, they split in two. So there he was back at the beginning, but not afraid to try again. He found himself a calabash. He hollowed it out, waited for the skin to dry, and piled all of the common sense inside. Next, he needed a hiding place. But Nancy made one mistake. He went out in search of something that his mother told him. Whenever you're looking for something, always start at home. Start in you. When Anansi came home, he looked at his backyard and there he found it, the large eucalyptus tree with its broad branches. He knew he would place his common sense there. Well, Anansi spun a web around himself and the calabash and began to climb. One foot, two foot, three foot, four, and he fell. One foot, two foot, three foot, four, he fell again. Well, Anansi was climbing and falling and climbing and falling, so much so that he was bringing in a crowd. All the neighbors wanted to know what this foolish spider was up to. It made no sense. Well, everyone gathered and no one said a word, and that's when she came. Shelly Ann was the cutest little five-year-old that you had ever seen in her Sunday dress and her two perfect pigtails. She looked around at all the grown-ups and wondered why they wouldn't tell Anansi what was wrong. Well, she called out, Bernancy. When Nancy looked down, she knew she had his attention and said, wouldn't it make more sense to put the calabash upon your back so that you can climb easily and freely? After Nancy had gone out into the world and collected all of the common sense, this little girl is going to come into his yard giving her two cents. This made Anansi so mad that he grabbed that calabash and he threw it to the ground. When it hit, it shattered in pieces and common sense took flight. It went east, west, north, south, and all around the world. So now, when we look back and we wonder how it is that in all of the places, both big and small, why there's common sense? Well, that's easy. It's Anansi who made it so. Thank you.